songs of worship this morning and our hymns and playing those and also in special music. As a child of God, let me just say as we start out, the certainty of the no matter what prepares you through a lot of tough times. It's not because of our strength. It's not because of our goodness. It's because of Him. Amen. Amen. Turn your Bible to the book of Matthew, chapter 13. I've got a lot of ground to cover. Um, just for the nature of this message, this is not one that I can break up. And so all I can say is, is, is uh, strap on your seatbelt, get your pen out, and hold on. I uh, sometimes say that, and then I'm not able to up here do what I need to do. So I may need a little help, and uh, I always need help. I have an announcement to make after I finish, and don't want to do that now. So if I forget to make that announcement, Johnny, you have to remind me. I'm just making sure he's paying attention right there. <laughs> I do have to say this publicly, since I said it publicly last week. Some of you don't have a clue what I'm saying. Okay, but those who were here last week, Sunday night, I know this, because I talked about uh, Selma's speed in driving behind me. But I also want to compliment her on something else this morning. She is the fastest smiler I have ever seen in my life. And I was over there earlier this morning and, and, and greeting that road, and this that and other, and she was talking to her sister, which is pretty normal. And, uh, and, 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 and and all of a sudden, just her face went from just the kind of regular, just a <laughs> lit up like a cube. And I've never seen anybody's countenance change that fast. But I got to see it this morning. So. All right. Matthew chapter 13. This is, we're going to look at the parable of the four souls. These four souls are the conditions of the heart. As God explains this. Now, some of you will remember several weeks ago as I, I preached a different message, I referred to the great crowds that followed Christ wherever he went to listen to his teachings. That is true, but they were a lot like people today. They were also there for handout. That's right. Okay? They wanted to see the, the, the miracles and all this, that, and other. But you know one thing about when they followed Jesus around, whenever he got ready to feed them, he always had a fish fry. That's right. And so they were waiting for another fish fry. Okay? And so, but at this point, they are there with him at the beginning. There's a great multitude there as Christ is teaching. As we get to the middle part there, when we'll shift gears, almost all of those leave. Do you know why they leave? Because they're not interested in what he has to say. Y'all hear me? All right. Matthew chapter 13. I'm going to go all the way through this. And you say, I know you say that's impossible for you to do. I'm going to go all the way through this. First verses 1 through 9. It says, the same day when Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside, and great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he had sowed, some of the seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them. Some fell upon stony places, where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness or depthness of the soil or the earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among the thorns. And the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground. And brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Verse number nine, it says, Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now, quickly, before we move on to the second part of this, in Christ's explanation and putting these things together, let's just make sure you, we do need to see this picture. Now, first of all, probably every single person that was there in those multitudes, they were all connected somehow, some way, to farming. 
That's one of the reasons why Christ is using this parable is so that they can relate to the things that he is telling them. They all have understanding. And as he's talking about the wayside and things of this nature and stuff, they're like, oh, I'm weird. I'm, I understand you. I'm hearing what you're saying. But we need to understand kind of the picture here of the sower. Okay. Before we move any forward. Okay. They didn't drill seed back in that day and all this other kind of stuff. They broadcast it. That's where the term comes from. Okay, as he casts the seeds, he's literally carrying on his back here a big pouch he's reaching into. Every, every cast is measured, okay? And so these seeds are falling upon different types of earth as he moves about the field. Now, the wayside here, as we get here first, understanding this, this is talking about a hardened path, okay? It's not, it's not talking about some, a cement, but it's hard as cement. This hardened path is the path that everybody takes going here, there, and yonder. Throughout the countryside, they're all walking. And when you walk over something over and over and over and over and over again, you don't have no grass on it. It's just a wide path. This, that, and other. The thing to remember here as we move forward is this hard path represents a hard heart. It represents a heart that's impenetrable, can we say. So let's move to the next said here where Christ is explaining as he comes to this portion where we're going to pick up now all of this crowd all well almost all of this crowd that had gathered to hear him had left and there's still some that are there okay? we don't know what how much time passed okay but if you've got great multitudes and they finally you know, meander off and go their own ways okay it's going to take a while but you've got some of that crowd and then you have the disciples. And so the second set, as Christ begins to explain, that's who the hearers are at this point. Okay? So picking up, we're going to slow down right here. Picking up in verse number 18. Christ says, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, coming back to that, and understanding it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. So first of all, we have this, this heart here that's represented by a hardened path. A hardened path. As I mentioned just a few moments ago, these hearts... As they hear the word of God. The word of God is the seed. We see earlier in verse number 19. It says when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom. Okay. Once again. Every single Jew there would have understood. Precisely what he's saying there. We Gentiles. Saved Gentiles. We know it because it's been revealed to us. In the word of God itself. But what God is talking about. He is talking about. Again, connected to what? The Abrahamic covenant. Amen. The kingdom which God has promised them that is to come in the future. Okay? Now their perspective was is that they were, they, were, they were ready for it to start right then there, run all the Romans out of the country, and start the kingdom, and just, just everything be great. That's what, in their mind, that's what they thought. It was not fulfilled. And it's going to be fulfilled, as we've talked about in the last few weeks. As Christ sets up a literal 1,000 year kingdom on this earth. But this is a kingdom that's ruled by God himself. Jesus Christ on the throne. Okay. But God has given an invitation. The seed here is an invitation for them to come to this kingdom. Okay. Leaving the kingdom that they're in now. Uh oh. I missed something. That's not quite understand. Are we talking about the kingdom of darkness? Leaving the kingdom of darkness. He has been giving them an invitation. With what? The seed is what? It is represented here the gospel of Jesus Christ himself. And he has given them an invitation to leave that kingdom of darkness to come to the kingdom of light. But what's happened? Over throughout the course of their life because of a, of, of a, of a whether it be lifestyle or just constant um, shall we say exposure and then them themselves do but he's, their, their lives is plagued with sin 
Can I tell you something this morning? That sin hardens your heart. Amen. We, we've heard different um, illustrations through, through the time that I've been here. I've given you different ones, but let me be brief in this one. Every single time that an individual rejects when they hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, or, or even beyond that, when they're encouraged by other Christians, or hear the word of God, whatever the case may be, when they reject that, we need to understand that something happens then and there is that their heart hardens a little more. Yes. And a little more. And a little more. And a little more. And it's literally as though this individual, whenever they first begin hearing, when the Holy Spirit of God first began convicting that heart, that the, the voice was loud. And you've heard me use this before, but I'll use it again. But we'll just use this, this name here, and we'll just, we'll just say that this individual's name is Thomas. Okay, if there's any Thomases in here, I, I apologize. But this, light, this message is loud in the sense that what? The Holy Spirit of God's message to that individual is, is that Thomas, you're guilty and you need to repent before Holy God. Amen. But time after time after time as this individual sets it away. Yeah. After a period of time, the voice is not here as loud. Right. Thomas, you're guilty. And time continues to pass in that voice is still even softer. We read further here in this passage. It says, and understand if it's not here, that's not a that's not a mental intellectual understanding. It's a recept, spiritual reception. Then cometh the wicked one and catch, catches the way that which is sown in the heart. Or in the earlier passage here, it talks about whenever these, these are introduced in verse number four. It says, and the fowls came and devoured them. Here in this situation, the wicked one is literally, uh, excuse me, it is Satan himself and his, again, those that he uses. In taking that word of God and snatching it away, Proverbs, the book of Proverbs tells us that, 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 he, that, that it is he that says it through his heart, there is no God. As that heart becomes seared, and as that heart gets harder and harder and harder, understand there's something else. When a heart grows harder, there's something else that grows, and it's pride with that individual's heart. And their non-need for anything that God can do for them, anything that God has already supplied for them. In their heart, they say, I am just as good as anybody else. I don't need those things. I don't need what God tells me I need. Hard heart. Another word, word God uses for that is being stiff-necked. Belligerent. See, that soil was never plowed. It just grew harder and harder and harder. So, well, what, what are some of the things that Satan uses to snatch away that? First of all, let me say this. God's invitation is only for a limited time. We don't have any idea how long God's going to continue to call a heart, continue to move upon a heart. I'm sure that maybe you even know of instances. Or you've heard people give testimony about different situations where people were being, being bothered by a holy God and under conviction on and on and on. But they themselves, they wanted no part of it whatsoever. And then suddenly, God didn't bother them with it anymore. Some of the things that, that Satan uses is the influence of false teachers. Uh -huh. Folks, let me tell you something. It is absolutely incredible the growth of false teaching in the world that we live in right now. Amen. Just in the last few years, there's been an absolute explosion. 
What else we mentioned? Pride. Doubt. Doubt. There's also procrastination. Oh, I hated that word when I was growing up because I was so good at it. Mm -hmm. But can I say this and listen to me carefully? I don't, I can't, I'm not, I can't, wouldn't if I did, could, I wouldn't give you a name of an individual. But I know that in the time that I've been here, there have been quite a number of visitors come through these doors that have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ come one time, come two times, and never see them again. That's right. come on. And I guarantee you there have been those that have heard, I guarantee you there have been those that have been under conviction of their own sin, and then whenever that time came, and I'm not talking about just the time of invitation, I'm talking about when God was speaking to their heart and showing them their guilt, there may have been in their mind an intellectual, shall we say, you know what, that, that's all right, I need to do, I need to, I need to, I need to. And they put it off and say, if that preacher would just shut up, I can get out there and get in my car and get away from here, and maybe next week. Yeah. That's right. Come on. Next week never comes. And over and over and over. <laughs> the love of Satan. Love of sin. Secondly, verse number 20. It says, But he that received the seed is in the stony places. The same is he that heareth the word, and anon with joy, they are in the course of reception. Joy received it. Be careful with that word. We're back to English words. Yet hath he no root in himself, but dureth for a little while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. It means he disappears. There are also individuals with a different kind of heart. And I've got to tell you, this, this one here, not that I haven't in, 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 in 30 years, 33 years now of preaching. Not that I haven't dealt with people with the hardened hearts. I certainly have. But it's the second group. It's the second group that are so excited that in times of counseling, and sitting down and opening the word, it's, it's, they're, they're so excited to become a child of God. They pray to receive Christ. Listen to me. That's why I say all the time, it's not about the few words that you pray. Amen. Do not be fooled about something you said once upon a time and base your salvation on that and that alone. There had better be something that follows that from that point forward, from then to now, no matter how long it is. There had better be a changing of your life. There had better be a complete takeover in the way that you think, in the way that you see things spiritually. Amen. Because there have been many, many that make a profession of faith, that get baptized, that are so excited. Hey, there's nothing wrong with excitement, amen? But let me tell you something. If you ever find yourself basing your salvation on your excitement that you had at that time and your experience, you probably got major problems. That's right. And then what happens? As this happens and that happens, you see, a lot of times people, people, they, 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 they grasp at God, they grasp at salvation to get them out of trouble. Come on! Amen. I've visited a lot of jails for 33 years. I ain't saying all of them ain't real. Some of them are. But I can also tell you that situations and people on the outside and, and the circumstances they're in at the moment, their thought is, and you know what? If 
if I get saved, if I get baptized, everything will be okay and this will get me out of trouble. Listen to me carefully. We're talking about those that have a counterfeit salvation. Say, so, well, how do you know this? Because of the fruit. Somebody, let's, let's, let's just get right where we are. Let's get right where the rubber meets the road. And if somebody makes a decision for Jesus Christ and joins a church through, through their salvation, this, that, and other, and you ain't seen them for five years, and you can't drag them back to church because they have no care or love whatsoever for the church of God, the people of God, the word of God, the preaching of God, if they have no desire in that whatsoever, that person's not saved. This is the group that keeps preachers up at night. Preachers aren't the only ones that are kept up at night. Family members that have watched their loved one go through this process of hurting. Because there's things they don't understand. We need to see, first of all, that person didn't lose their salvation. Y'all hear me? You can't lose it. If you could lose your salvation, every person in this room would have already lost their Including this preacher, probably a whole bunch of you. So I never had it. Well, so many people think, you know, boy, if I get saved, there'll be no more problems. I won't have any more problems in life. Everything's going to be rosy. But what do we see here in this passage here as we've just read? It says, when tribulation or persecution arises, because the word of the It doesn't say if. There's, there's no if there. It says when it rises. Every child of God in this room right now, you could stand from now to date dark tomorrow telling us about all the things you've been through in this life. All the trials of life. All the problems of life. All this that stuff. And can I tell you, a lot of times when we can get bogged down in all that, there has to be a point within all of that that we take a deep breath and say, well, hold on just a minute. Let me tell you who brought me through these things. Amen. Let me tell you who, let's, let's, let's get real right here. Let me tell you who carried me through these things. Amen. Number three, thorny ground. Actually, here it talks about it's, 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 it's not it's not expressing here the thorns. We it's talking about weeds. For every person in here that that, that that has a garden of any kind, I don't care if it's a five-gallon bucket of tomato plant. If you don't take care of it, you don't have weeds growing up all around that plant. I've got the finest weed garden on the earth. <laughs> Y'all need to come see. I've got Daily and I've got her five roses, the kind that and you can't mess up. They're still alive. I just, I'm talking about a hundred degrees. I just got out there and got all those weeds and all that grass that grows up that high around. You can't even see the rows. I just got all that stuff out and I'm sitting out there yesterday afternoon watching my hummingbirds and what am I looking at? That dog go grass come back. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's part of the curse. That's right. You read about Genesis chapter 3. But this ground, this is a reference to other things in the soil that will choke out. The primary reference here is we get down to this in verse number 22. It says, and the care of this world, that means worldliness, and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, he becometh unfruitful. Let's go to the book of 1 John. Quick, hold your place here. We're coming back. Let's go to 1 John chapter 2. Two verses. 1 John chapter 2. 
And I'm just giving you the, the, the quickest, most familiar. Verse number 15 and 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh. Let's go back to 15 first. You have 15? Fifteen says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's an absolute statement. That's not an either or or maybe so or an if. There's no asterisk there whatsoever. It's either or. Verse 16 says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of this world. Now, this is... This is difficult to, 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 to explain and understand, and then it's easy to. And there's a term that's risen in the last, I don't know how many years, but quite a few. And as soon as I say this term, it's going to give you an understanding of world. So the term is pop culture. Knowing every little thing, every little fad, every little, every little uh, group that you shouldn't be listening to in the first place because of all the trash. You know what, if we could just get God, uh, Christians off of ungodly music, that'd be a huge first step. But the on and on and on and on and on the worldliness. But what it's referring to here, we'll get to the riches here in just a moment, but it's referring to that, that, that unquenchable, can't turn loose. Yes. The best illustration in all the scripture is Lot's wife. Remember what happened there? Sodom and Gomorrah was going to be destroyed. The angels would come and said, we, we fixed to wipe this place out. Get your family, get ready, because we're out of here. They left, and that's why earlier, earlier, they left out. But as they're leaving, they're running Lot, his two daughters, which were problems, and then Lot's wife, okay, which was a problem, it was, it's revealed at this point. But as they're going out, and the Word of God talks, she didn't just peek back. She can't stand what she's leaving behind. See, she had it made there. Husband sat at the gate. He was one of the judges of the city. They had one of the best malls and all that part of the world. Best dress shops. They had sandals there. You couldn't get nowhere else. I, I know I'm just filling in some blanks here. But you see, when it comes time to leave, that point, that word, that the word there is it talks about them taking her literally means to pull forward or to drag. And she refused, she fought back, and then what happened? No one saw. You see, that love of the world ch chokes out. But if the word, if the love of God is real in that heart, it won't choke it out. You see, the Word of God tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, that whosoever be in Christ is a new creature. The old things are what? Passed away. Behold, all things become new. You see, there's not a situation where, where a Christian prays a prayer, gets baptized, and then, you know, they, they kind of have to make some decisions for themselves. And maybe they might drift over here and might know. They're either saved or they ain't saved. Now, I realize I couldn't, you know, if, if I'm down at First Baptist down here, First West, I can't say that. Saved or ain't saved, but I probably would anyway. Because it's either or, folks. That's right. It's either or. But then the deceitfulness of riches. Oh, there's so many stories of individuals that make a profession of faith that get involved in church and this, that, and other. And all of a sudden, everything changes so much, and all they can think about is that money, that career, the things that the church is taking them away from. That's right. And they desire those riches, they desire that career, they desire that bank account more, which means what? They're worshiping the God of mammon more than they are the God of heaven. Pray to God, that's not the only supplies. That those three are not the only souls. There's one more thing. Verse 23. But he that receives seed into the good ground. Now let's stop right there. Now this is important. 
Because we need to understand this before we move any further whatsoever. If you're here today and you're saved, you need to understand it's not because of your goodness. Right. It's not because Christ kind of wandered, the Holy Spirit wandered around and looked for different people. So, oh, you know what? You know what? That Butch Dix, he's the best guy over here in this area. I'm going to save him. The Bible says that his heart was wicked. Bible says that Kyle Thomas Bryan's heart was wicked before a holy God. Undeserved. The only thing that I deserve is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is eternity of hell. That's right. But because of the grace of a holy God. You say, well, what's the, how does the good ground fit into these? The good ground is the tilling, shall we say. It's a process that begins before salvation. And that what? Holy Spirit conviction. There's a receptiveness. There's a tenderness. There's a there's a there's this that, no, there's not a rejection side we say. And yes, it may take time, but through all that process, that heart has a shall we say a, 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 a. now understand this. We're not talking. This can happen in a hurry, but there's a yielding to what God says. And that as that individual, when they get saved, they realize that they're completely guilty. Amen. And that everything that God says is true. And that they fault him and that, that they're guilty, that they're a sinner. Understand this, that's the good ground. Amen. I've been around farming. I'm, I'll be 62 year old next week. I've been around farming for way over 40 years. I've seen some ground, whew, pitiful, but I've seen some ground that even I could grow stuff on. I used to bow hunt up Illinois, southeast, southeast Illinois there along the Mississippi River. Listen to this. There's a long stretch there with 17 to 19 foot of topsoil. Wow. Amen. This preacher could grow tomatoes up there. <laughs> You need to understand that good soul of your heart. The Holy Spirit of God convicted you with his, with his seed of, of, of the kingdom. His seed of, the, of, of coming into the kingdom of life. His seed of salvation rested on the heart that he made for you. That he made receptive. Okay. Folks, we need to understand something. Salvation is holy of the Lord. Amen. We don't deserve it whatsoever. We see in this parable here, we see the four types of soul. We see why people have these hearts. We see what they go through spiritually. Do you know that through those doors at different times, all four of those hearts have come through? Amen. All four of those hearts. <coughs> and it's possible it's possible that even here today that there's someone that's heard over and over that's rejected and that heart is becoming harder and, 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 and if you'll just be honest with yourself and just, just, just right now, listen if you'll be honest with yourself you might would say you know what this message about salvation doesn't disturb me near about as bad as it did once upon a time. There may be someone here today that, 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 that because of, 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 of different areas in their life, say, well, I'm just going to put this off one more Sunday. This is I'll do this later. <clears throat> What I would say to you right now, every head bowed, every eye closed, is this. What we're talking about, the message that I've given you, what the Word of God says is very real. And that there is going to come a time that is appointed unto man, it's appointed unto you, the Bible tells us, a time of judgment. Just being here today in this church won't get you in heaven. Put money in that altar party won't put get you in heaven. Being baptized won't get you into heaven. 
there has to be a point in your life when you see your guilt, you see yourself as God sees you. Knowing that you're guilty, knowing that you're lost, and understanding that you cannot fix it yourself. But by faith, you must believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you, for your sins, every single one of them. But for your nature, your sinful nature. And that you must repent. Repent is far more than just saying, I'm sorry, God. No, repentance is, comes with, shall we say, with the spiritual understanding of your sin, the conviction that you're guilty and not wanting that part of your life anymore. Wanting that gone out of your life. Turning away from it. Yes, asking God to forgive you of your sins is part of that. You must believe that Jesus died on that cross to pay for your sin. The last part is this. God convicts your heart because he knows you'd spend eternity with him in heaven forever. His instructions are, are, are perfect, they're true. He's going to keep his end. In so much as he makes a promise to us in the book of Romans, chapter 13, he says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He does not say maybe. He doesn't say I'll have to think about this a while. And praise God, he doesn't say, well, not you. You, your sins are too big. He never says that. God can't go back on his promises. If you're here today, don't put it off. Don't wait till another time, until it's convenient. Don't worry about what the, what the whisper in your ear, possibly even now, of what will all these people think. I got news for you. These people are going to praise God. Amen. If you're here today and you're without Christ, mm -hmm. in a few moments, Brother Bill's going to come. He's going to sing the hymn of invitation. I'll be standing down front. Come down and take me by the hand. Let me show you in his word what I've just explained. For Christians that are here today, say, well, <laughs> hey, well this, this is primarily about, this is about people that are unsaved. What's the message for me? The message for you is that there are people that you influence every single day. There are people that God's put on your heart. This burden your heart with that's lost. And you have a responsibility to God, and you have a responsibility to that individual that's lost to be praying for them constantly, faithfully. God may be speaking in your heart about ways that he can use you. Don't say no. Father, right now, God, as we come to this portion of our service, God, I pray that you move upon hearts in a mighty way. In your son's precious name, I pray. Amen.